Cambridge Centre for Computing History. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Lisa Magetti. I've been managing our lottery funded Swiss Rolls Tea in the Electronic Office project since 2018 now. Um, we're now approaching the end of the project, so we're having this celebration today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, just so you know a little bit about me, I was one of the founders of the museum. Um, I'm now the, the CEO of the museum, um, and I have a real passion for computing history and a real passion also for Leo. So I need to say some thank yous really before we start. And the thank yous really are to the National Lottery Heritage Fund and to everybody who plays the National Lottery without the funding that organisations like um, the Lottery Fund give us we would not be able to do the work that we've been doing. So thank you, biggest thank you to you. Um, also biggest thanks from us as a museum to the Leo Computer Society. Um, our chair, their chair here is Peter Byford, um, who will be speaking shortly. Um, the society have given us the privilege really of holding their Leo collection, and that's at the center of the project. So we, again, we wouldn't have been able to do the project without the material that the society have loaned us. Okay, um, so big thanks to both organisations. Um, finally, the project itself and the plan for today. When we were planning today, we kind of felt that the project should speak for itself. You don't want to listen to me talking about what we've done. So we've tried to let the, the main outputs, if you like, speak for themselves. So you will, after hearing from the three of us, on the stage here, you will then hear from Elizabeth Amori, who, Dr. Elizabeth Amori, <laughs> who used the archive um, as part of her PhD research, um, which she was successfully awarded in 2022. So we've actually got a user of the archive here who used it very successfully to get her PhD. Uh, well done, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> and then we will hear from Richard Hollingham, who is over there, who made our Leo film. I hope you've all seen it. It's on YouTube, freely available. It will also be playing in the classroom at the um, lunch break. So you'll be able to see the film if you haven't already. Oh, excuse me. Um, and then this afternoon, no, before that, then we will have Chris Monk, who is sitting on the end there, who will be telling us about the virtual Leo One, which is probably the most innovative part of the project. Um, it's a way that we're planning to, or we are, making access or providing access to the archive that's at the center of the project, but in a way that means that we don't have to degrade the artifacts that we're looking after. So that, that kind of step back so that people have immediate access to it, but without actually being able to handle it, it's really exciting as a museum to be able to do stuff like that. So the Leo display is behind those panels there. You'll be able to have a look later. The virtual Leo one is part of that display so please do have a look a bit later on. There'll be some opportunities for demos too a little bit later on. Okay, I'm not gonna to talk too much um, about anything else. So I just want to say, I'm gonna introduce next Gareth Marlowe, who is our chair of trustees, and then Peter Byford, who is the chair of the Leo Computer Society. Um, before then, I will say a final thank you to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who are the reason that we're here. We would not be able to do this without their funding. And rounding off this morning, um, Brittany Archibald, who is in front of us here, will just be saying a few words from the funder's perspective. So that's this morning. This afternoon, we have a panel discussion chaired by Frank Clange, who is at the end there, one of the Leo pioneers. There are a few of the pioneers here in this room today. So thank you all of you for your support over the course of the project, but also to Frank for chairing this afternoon's panel. And also, of course, to the panelists who will be joining him on the programme. Okay, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Gareth Marlowe, Chair of Trustees. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Centre for Computing History. Um, it's become clear thinking about Leo and the impact that it's had on technology, uh, uh, just what a, a fundamental part of the story, this work, the work of these people uh, has been. You know, it, it, we talk about standing on the sh shoulders of giants uh, and the people who undertook this work were certainly doing that and those who have come after have been doing that. 
And it's really only as a result of this project that I've come to appreciate just how influential that has been in, in my career, the 30 years that I've spent working in Cambridge in, in software. So I just wanted to mention three things this morning. The first, the, the, that clarity of the importance of Leo uh, and how important it is for us at CCH to be able to play a role in telling that story. When I was visiting my dad a couple of weekends ago, uh, I was talking to him about what was uh, going on here. He was an industrial chemist and graduated in 1963. And he got very agitated and excited when I told him uh, what was taking place and said, we had a, we had a Leo. Uh, we, we, I came out of university, I started work, and we, we had a Leo. And it completely changed the way that we did chemistry. From what I learned at university in the first three years of the 60s to what we were doing in the second half of the 60s, it changed everything. Uh, and that was, that was absolutely you know, wonderful for, for, for me to hear from my dad and then to know that we were coming here and, 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 and playing a part in, in, in this story. The second thing that I wanted to mention this morning is just how excited I am by the innovative approach that this project has been able to take uh, to, to help to tell the story. Um, I mean, as you can see, looking around the museum, we very much uh, favor giving people the opportunities to get hands-on with the artifacts, with the technology that, that has made the difference. And that becomes very difficult when, you know, the, those artifacts are scarce, they're rare, they're fragile, you know, they're incomplete. And yet, you know, through the innovation in this project, we've been able to find a way of, of, of making it feel more complete, of giving a more complete experience. And I think that's great, not just for this project, but it helps us to understand really how we're going to be able to carry on telling parts of the wider story of the impact that technology has had on our lives. Because it's, it's often not just as easy as saying, look, there's a computer, that's what it was like, right? The whole experience is harder to bring about. And I, and I think that the team have done a fantastic job here in, in doing those innovative things. And the, th and the final thing I just wanted to mention this morning was just to pay tribute to the people who have been involved in, in this project. I mean, we're very keen, I think, to now move on and forget about how awful COVID and the pandemic was. And yet COVID and the pandemic was, was absolutely right in the, you know, the, the middle part of, uh, of, uh, of this project. And, and if you remember back to that awful time, we, we, we didn't know what was going to happen, right? And we were trying to figure out day to day, week to week, what we were going to you know, have to do, and yet the people involved in this project sort of found ways of taking the work you know, uh, remote, distributed, and, and, and pushing it forward. Um, uh, and in particular, I, um, I want to thank, because Lisa has given her thanks already, I want to thank Lisa uh, for um, her leadership of the work and for, for, for Chris, um, to Chris as well. Uh, you know, I, I just, it was so difficult to do this work. Uh, over lockdown, uh, and yet they, they sort of carried on and they pushed on, and, and you can see and appreciate the results of their work today. Uh, so that's it for me. Thank you once again, and welcome once again from me. I hope you all have a super day. I'm very excited to see the film again, to have another go on the virtual experience again, uh, you know, to take part in the, in the discussions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the day, and, um, and welcome. Thank you. Right, good morning everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the Society and its relationship with CCH. Um, the Society has evolved from running ad hoc reunions um, for LEO staff in the early years. These are run by Roy Farrant, who sadly passed away in March this year. Roy passed the baton to me in 1981 and somehow I've never managed to get rid of it. Um, I do recommend our book, Leo Remembered, which has many articles in it, and including an article about the evolution of the society. And um, I believe you can buy it here today if you haven't already done so. Um, in 2017, Lisa McGurty contacted the society and said that CCH would like to hold a Leo event. Well, we were delighted at that um, idea, so we were fully supportive. And this, this was a successful event, the first probably big event since the, other than the reunions. Lisa then proposed that the Society and CCH should form a partnership to which the Society's uh, committee agreed, 
and we could see a big advantage over it. In addition, it was agreed that we should apply for a National Heritage Lottery Heritage Grant uh, to allow us to push forward with some of the work we wanted to do. We had been thinking about the VR of Leo One for many years, and of course we had piles of documentation in various people's homes that we had nowhere to put. So CCH said, you can give it to us, which was delightful. Um, so we pushed forward with that, and uh, as you know, you will hear details of the work which was funded by the lottery, by the grant. Soon after this, the society successfully applied to become a charity, which gave us a number of benefits, including a certain financial benefits. And it also meant, uh, no, they always told us we weren't, um, uh, we weren't an entity, we weren't a legal entity, but once you're a charity, you are. And it made life a lot easier when it came to copyrights and other things. Soon after this, the society's success... Oh, sorry, I've said that. Um, the society has well widened its membership over the years and is now open to anyone who has an interest in the Leo story, whether or not they worked on Leo machines. We now have around 650 members living in 28 countries, um, the youngest being a computer science student in India who has attended some of our... Um, forums. Um, the forums have made life a lot easier, have meant that we can talk to a lot of people and I do recommend you, you uh, looking at our for forums, the Zoom forums. You don't have to be uh, close by any longer, you can uh, watch us from Australia, New Zealand, uh, wherever. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Lisa, Chris and Richard Monk, our two archivists, Jude and Luke. Luke is with us today. Um, and of course, um, um, Richard Holling Hollingham and all those involved in the project, which has done so much to raise the knowledge. I should say Richard is our filmmaker. Uh, we are very grateful indeed to the NLHF for enabling us to make such progress in our work of preserving and promoting Leo's heritage. I've got one extra, and this is the commercial. Um, the society needs help. We need one or two more trustees and a few volunteers. One activity we want to launch is a research project into which museums and repositories hold, uh, that hold Leo material. If you think you might be able to spare some time, then come and talk to me um, or another trustee. Um, that's all for now. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the day. I, I'm excited by what we're going to see. I hope you are as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Elisabetta Mori, and I, I'm here today because I was uh, awarded the uh, David Tresman uh, Kaminer Scholarship for the History of Computing. And uh, uh, that, was, that took place at the uh, University of Middlesex in London. And um, I'm here ex in particular to tell you how I use the archive for my PhD research. Um, so in particular, I had to research the video computers uh, and I did that through archival research memoirs and interviews with some of the people that are here today, uh, and oral histories, uh, and uh, also researching the literature. And by doing this, I started researching uh, several archives in Europe, and in particular, the Leo archives that was at Hilary Kaminer's uh, home. So many times it was like her father documents were there. And uh, this eventually uh, became part of what is the CCH collection. 
And so mainly what I would like to, uh, to tell you about is that uh, what happened with the CCH and the National Heritage Lottery Fund here uh, really, really improved how us historians uh, could um, deal with such materials. In particular, um, the fact that many of the documents that are there are digitized. For us, historians, it's something that it's really, it's really, really important because it, typically when you do you know, archival research, you have to go physically to the archive, make an appointment. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's uh, kind of difficult. Some archives uh, are not going to let you uh, go there before months. So this is something that has, uh, you know, it, it can take really time to access them. And, uh, and then once you're, once you're there, it's not always allowed to have reproductions of the documents. This means that uh, sometimes you're allowed to take your own pictures, but sometimes you have to pay for reproductions. And of course, this can also uh, be a problem uh, if, you don't, if you don't have enough funding to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, the documents you might need. Uh, and eventually, once you have collected all the documents, you have to organize them. and so. All of these, it's something that now with the uh, archival material that is here at CCH is basically already done and uh, accessible to everyone. And uh, in this sense, this is not just uh, uh, useful, but also uh, good um, in terms of uh, the environment, because sometimes I have to, I had to travel to Berlin, I had to travel to Italy, I had to travel to France to access these documents. Whereas with the Leo uh, archive now, I just uh, can access that from every, anywhere in the world, and this is uh, very good. Uh, and uh, it's 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 something that really will help also to have other historians research on the archive. And so, you know, like, this is like the Leopedia that is there, that was already there, and thanks to the work of uh, Frank Land. Uh, but in particular, you know, now if I, uh, you know, want to go back to what I've researched so far and have a double check, I can go to the archive uh, and, uh, for, for instance, uh, take a look of, uh, at what is there, and it's this means that in all, in only in one place, I can have the David Chesma Kaminer papers, but maybe other papers that were uh, that, that were updated in a collection. Because what the Leo Society did in the last years, it was really to expand the archive and collect much more materials that I couldn't access when I came here the first time. So the good thing is that the archive is not just. Uh, online, but it's also constantly updated. And this is also good for me if I want to go back to some topic I already researched and I want to check if there is something uh, else that appeared. So I, I really think that um, what happened with the National he uh, Heritage Lottery Fund was really, really, really beneficial for my PhD. Um, and yes, and in particular, the outcomes were uh, for were not just my PhD thesis, but also um, four papers. Uh, three of them have been already published, whereas the uh, fourth is under um, publication and under it, it, it's been accepted. It's uh, uh, really in the process of being published this year, uh, and this also is uh, thank, thanks to the. Uh, the Leo archive that I could research uh, remotely also during the pandemic. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the people. I mean, in this room, there are like, I think perhaps more than half of the people that are here were supporting my PhD in many ways. Uh, so I, this, I would like to take this chance just also to really thank all of you for your, for you know, our work so far. Thank you very much.
do this one. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Richard Hollingham. Um, first of all, it's just such a privilege to be involved in this, in this project. Um, I was one of the filmmakers that made the Leo film. Uh, hopefully, you'd like to see it again at lunchtime. I've watched it a few times. It's really good. <laughs> um, so I'm also speaking on behalf of um, Jamie as well, who uh, Jamie Partridge, who was the director on the film. We made it uh, together. Um, just wanted to talk you through how we went about making the film and what we did, what our thinking was. So uh, we won the tender for this in, I think it was uh, October 2020. Um, we had no idea in October 2020, as uh, Lisa's already mentioned with the pandemic, that how we were going to do this. Um, but we carried on anyway. Uh, we wanted to tell the story of Leo by the people involved, and that's key. It's the, it's the real people who were involved in it. We were very keen, um, this became a bone of contention later, but we won't go into that, uh, to not have any narration in the, uh, in the film. We wanted to use... Um, either captions or have people tell their own, their own story. We wanted to convey why Leo was important. Crucially as well, how it worked, which was a, was a tough one. Um, we wanted it to be engaging and entertaining, which is crucial because we want to reach beyond the Leo fan club. We want to reach as many people as possible with this. And we also want to make it relevant to today. Why are we telling this story? What is it we use computers for today that we can relate back to Leo. So they were our challenges, and that's what we put in our pitch document rather optimistically. What we call the assets, so this is what we had, this is what we had to work with. So we had um, interviews, which, you know, was, they were going to be our key, our interviews, our personal stories. We had some archive film, but not as much as you can find online, because we could only use the stuff we could clear the copyright for. We had Obviously, the amazing archive photographs. Um, the EDSAC rebuild at Bletchley. Um, we also, again at Bletchley, we had access to punched card uh, readers and tape readers and printers, so things that moved. And, of course, uh, the expertise here at the Centre for Computing History. Um, and we had cakes. Very keen to use cakes throughout, and you'll probably see cakes throughout the, uh, not every interview, but we try to do it in every interview. Um, sourcing Lion's brand cakes is really hard. I scoured supermarkets in several towns and online to find Lion's branded cakes, or cakes that were very similar. Actually, a couple were not Lion's brand, but they looked like Lion's brand cakes. Um, so all the cakes are real, actual Lion's cakes. Uh, uh, throughout the film. This is the, the crunch bit, though, what we didn't have. So we didn't have any Leo computers. We didn't have a Leo 1 to film. Um, and we also didn't have any archive of how Leo 1 worked. So none of the archive really has that or explains it properly. We had, of course, some superb interviewees, like Frank here, who was just amazing. Um, and it was just a, such a privilege to talk to them, and two of them sadly no longer with us. So the way we did the interviews, um, set up Zoom calls to start with, chatted to all the uh, potential interviewees, chatted to more people than we actually used, which is one of the realities of doing these sorts of films. Because ultimately, it's about the audience at the end of the day. So I had a few conversations with people, and we decided to do some interviews, decided not to do other interviews. Um, and you might upset people along the way, but really it's about getting the, the best people at the end of the day. Uh, so this was, I'd expect you to read this, but you know, I had Zoom calls, we did a bit of research, I wrote up my notes, this is Frank Land's notes, um, with about Frank and about his background, and I typed up some questions. I didn't want to embarrass myself when I did these interviews uh, by not knowing what I was talking about, but I learned so much from talking to these people. And then what we did was uh, did the interviews uh, on location as much as possible in people's homes, in people's houses, with cakes, ideally. Um, and then I ran them through um, an AI program we use called Trint, which is a transcription program, um, which gosh, saved us so much time uh, as filmmakers. We used to have to manually transcribe everything out. 
And then you can see the areas highlighted there. So they were bits we thought might work for the film. And we literally had, I wish I'd taken a picture of it, um, the floor just covered with, this was not environmentally friendly. We had to print them out in the end because we couldn't work it out on our heads. Um, we printed them out with these highlighted uh, areas and cut them up and rearranged them on the floor um, of how we put the film together and how we told the story. So you want the interviews to tell the story of Leo and not have to use captions all the way through. Uh, we also had some great archive. Um, and I wanted to play you, the sound is not very good on this, so we tidied up the sound. The bit you see in the film has, we've spent quite a lot of time processing the sound. Um, this is just the worst interview I have ever, ever seen. Um, it's this B, the full version of the BBC interview, um, which we were able to use for the film. And I just think it's excruciating. I actually do quite a lot of media training, is teaching people how to do interviews. And I use this for the training of how not to do an interview. So anyway, uh, I'm going to play it to you. So sorry about the sound, but this was the original uh, BBC archive. Um, Mr. Thompson, first of all, what do you get out of the machine here? You're using it for payslips? We're doing payroll, yes. Uh -huh. And h how many payslips can you get out of the machine, say, per minute? Well, we can do about 40 in a minute at the moment, and that's one every one, every one and a half seconds. And how long would it take a normal clerk to work out a payslip? Well, with the help of traditional modern machinery in the office, it would take a minimum six minutes. And how many valves are there in the calculator itself? About 5,000. Do you get a lot of trouble from them? Maintenance trouble? No. We test them every day, or test some of them every day, and we have a means of detecting when they're beginning to go wrong. We can remove them in time. And well, what other jobs have you done with the machine? Working out the paths of shells, uh, helping the meteorological people to see if they can forecast weather by numerical calculations, and uh, working out positions of atoms in crystals, all it's kinds of things. Well, it certainly is a brain to be envied. Yeah, well, um, I, I can't, I've never seen an interview where the interviewer and the interviewee look so uncomfortable. <laughs> and the questions are so rubbish, as are the answers. But uh, there's a reason we didn't include the whole thing in it. But it is, it is great, and it's very of its time. Uh, um, so the thing that was missing from our story and from all the archive, and we did do some interviews, and we did interview people about this, but it's very difficult to explain, for particularly things like mercury delay lines. Um, I was explaining how mercury delay lines work to someone yesterday, and their mind was just blown that the idea that you would store uh, data in tubes of mercury just seems extraordinary now. Um, so we wanted to put an animation in, but we wanted to put an animation in um, that fitted with the rest of the film. Uh, and so the intention was that this animation, and, for, and people think it, it really is this, we wanted it to look like archive. We wanted it to look like found footage that someone we had discovered and it was around the archive. Um, it wasn't. It was. It's re we, we spent a lot of time doing the animation. Um, but I'm so glad we did. Um, it wasn't really in our budget, but we just felt we really wanted to do the animation. Um, so this is um, it's not my original storyboard. My original storyboard, my drawing was shocking. This is actually uh, drawings by, I need to credit her, um, Sue Nelson, who's also my wife, uh, a science journalist. So she did the drawings here. Uh, but this is my storyboard for it uh, with some of the comments. Um, so you've got things like in brackets, bits of brain lighting up on that. Um, and just some comments of what works and what doesn't work. I think there's a comment there that that clock didn't quite work. And then uh, Rory, our animator, turned it into that fantastic animation you see. Uh, the plummy voice, voiceover on that, is actually done by Jamie, the filmmaker, who used to be an actor. So he's been to drama school, so uh, uh, that was just a very cheap way of doing it. Uh, he did it as a sort of scratch version, as a sort of, you know, just so we knew the timing of it. And then we just thought we'll leave it, because it sounded really great. Um, really pleased with that. So we're really pleased that we were able to get in the, the how it worked aspect of things. Um, and this is, I thought you'd be, feel shortchanged if you didn't see the actual animation. Leo is popularly known as an electronic brain. Its heart is a clock, the drumbeat of the machine. Leo takes its orders or program from code punched into paper tape. 
or punched cards. It converts these into the language it understands, zeros and ones, or binary. Electronic valves are used as switches to add or subtract. Together, hundreds of valves perform complex calculations in fractions of a second. Everything is kept in check by Leo's own electronic brain called the coordinator. Leo stores its instructions, or the information the computer is working on, in memory. It uses an ingenious system of tubes filled with liquid mercury. Inside these mercury delay lines, the electronic zeros and ones are converted by a transducer into sound. Sound travels more slowly through mercury than the electrons in the circuit, temporarily delaying the information. Leo can store thousands of bits of information this way, looping them back through the tubes and only releasing them when the coordinator is ready for the next step. When Leo has finished its calculations, it prints out the results. So we're really pleased with how that animation all worked out. Uh, Jamie's actually in his 30s, uh, just in case you... So, proper acting there. Um, also, when you see the Mercury delay line, you saw this little, little spider's web. Uh, the original version had a mouse, but we decided there shouldn't be a mouse in a uh, cake factory. So we took the mouse out. The other thing we were missing, and when you want to do anything filming, um, it's not w just what it looks like, it's moving things. And a computer, by its nature, most of it doesn't move. So we went to Bletchley and just filmed some moving things. Uh, so the punched card reader, we've got the uh, tape reader, I don't think it's on this, and a printer, and then we made them black and white afterwards. Uh, and we also tried to, we, um, we had quite a lot of discussion that the cards shouldn't be coloured cards, because it was an IBM machine, so we, did, uh, uh, we made sure they weren't uh, in, the final, in the final film. Uh, so these are just, I thought you might like to see this. Um, we did a, a day's filming, we just spent a whole day filming printers and punched card readers, all sorts of other things, um, and we just put this together into the rushes. This was just at the end of the day, and we put it to music, and I think it's rather beautiful. There's lots more of that. I think there's potential for a whole YouTube channel of uh, moving bits of computers. It's, it's very therapeutic watching that. It's really fun. Um, the other thing um, we wanted to do was that juxtaposition between the old and the new and the relevance of the old to the new. And that's what we tried to do with the opening section. Um, and when you see this, you might think it's shot in a museum. It's actually shot in our house. Um, and it's inspired by anyone saw the WandaVision TV series, Marvel WandaVision, it has the same mixer Despite and the, the same ideas. Despite the large number of employed today, that. sufficient clerks are still hard to find. With full employment, the security of clerical work does not offer the old attraction. Working on Leo, there was a buzz. You're doing something new, and you're discovering something every single day. Well, I went straight into being a programmer, but then there were only very few of us at that point. I mean, this was 1952. I was the first woman. To fulfill this modern and what need, we're doing is zooming in gradually. Leo, the first the automatic screen. office in the world. Electronic computers are not new, but Leo was the first designed for office work. So exciting because you were in the forefront of technology. You were aware of everything new and the progress. And sort of after the Thanks. war and austerity, that was, it was just brilliant. You are part of the development of today. Oh, yes, one feels one's part of, of the world.
binary, by the way. We won't watch the whole film, it's okay. <laughs> you can do that at lunchtime. Um, but it's trying to mix the old and new. It's trying to layer everything as well. So it was the idea of having the cakes all the way through, things like the binary there. So it's, it's greater than a sum of its parts. Uh, and also not getting too bogged down in cakes, but you're telling the story and using the archive to tell a lot of that, that story there at the beginning. Uh, so it won an award. Um, this is a, not the best known award, but it's hugely important to me, and um, it's really an award by my peers. It's the Association of British Science Writer Awards, which are really prestigious for you know, science writers, science um, radio producers, radio presenters. Um, you know, they're typically won by national press, so BBC, Economist. Um, so it was just fantastic to, to win one of these. Um, and it's had 11,000 views on YouTube, which is really good. Uh, it deserves more. It deserves national broadcast. It's fantastic. And it's only fantastic because of the men and women in the film. Um, and as I say, it's just an absolute privilege to have been uh, part of that. And we're really proud of, of the film. And I'm just so glad, looking at the comments on, the, on it, just so glad of the response. So thank you very much. Now, you might wonder what I'm passing to Richard, who's my son. Um, our session is going to be about creating the virtual Leo One. And he's been the brains behind all the technology. So when they said, you'll have a clicker, I thought, I've got to give it to him. <laughs> because I'm bound to press the wrong thing. And um, as Dan at the back there, who's working the camera, has told me, don't press the wrong button. <laughs> um, so... Uh, yeah, the two of us have been working on this project what seems like forever. Um, and we've been creating the virtual Leo One, really trying to uh, address, I suppose, three particular passions. Um, one was to be part of the celebration of this amazing machine and the amazing room that it was in, plus the people that worked there. We wanted to be part of that and to contribute to that. We wanted to develop a resource that might be used by young people. I, I, I'm a, I was a teacher, so I'm very keen to see how we might use resources to help young people who have a, an incredibly powerful computer in their pocket understand that once upon a time you could stand inside a machine and it could still do something good. So um, thirdly, um, we wanted to explore, uh, and this is something that will emerge over time, we wanted to explore how virtual environments might assist. Don't forget that Leo, the machine, Leo 1, is gone. Cadby Hall, the calculator room, has gone. Cadby Hall has gone. Lions headquarters has gone. And very little of this remarkable piece of history is with us. So sometimes it's appropriate to look at technology and particularly virtual technologies to see if we can't bring some of that back. So some of this was an exploration of that particular theme. Okay, next one, Richard, thank you. Um, the characteristics of our work? Well, we wanted to try to be accurate. We could have sort of stood back and, and, and painted something, an artist's impression, but we did really try to, uh, uh, to collect as much information as possible in order to make what we've done as accurate as possible. I wanted it to be accessible so that if, if, if a child goes into the virtual Leo and they decide to turn right rather than turn left, fine, no problem. I wanted people to choose if they wanted to just go and look at it or go deeper and find out what objects were, or deeper still, and start to read particular documents. Choice in how they accessed this resource. Um, we wanted to seed evidence, evidence that is in the archive currently, but we've brought together 
a selection of it, to be part of the scene. Taken some of those documents that once existed in the calculator room at Cadby Hall and bringing them back into the virtual Cadby Hall. Um, it was going to be a blend of graphics, uh, imagery, documents and text, bringing all those together to make something that was hopefully um, fascinating to try. There were challenges. Um, could we get enough information is always a worry. Could we really have enough information, whether it's a measurement of how long something is, right the way through to all, all manner of things that are necessary if you're going to try and build um, a, a virtual version of something? Could we get enough information? Could we get the software tools together and make them work together? And believe you me, up until about half past eight this morning, that was still a challenge. <laughs> We've fought against uh, all manner of problems with, with, with software. Time, would there ever be enough time to do everything? And the answer to that was clearly no, because it's a wonderful story and a wonderful room and a wonderful machine, but there was never enough time to do everything. It, remember, too, it was one room. We were not trying to do the entire administration block at Cadby Hall. We had to pack all that we wanted to do into one room, and that was a bit of a struggle for the software, who, frankly, is, is, is usually used to develop games on different levels and over vast spaces. But we were all in one room for our adventure in the calculator room. Um, the period was not going to be one particular flash of, of inspiration in Leo's life. It was going to be a period of time. We've always recognised that there was a period of time when Leo I was conceived and then built um, and then developed and finally was in full operation. And we've tried to combine some of that. So we've, we've been a little bit cheeky with, with, with timescales. Um, and then along came COVID, and that made everything a lot harder. We couldn't get to the places we wanted to, and when we did, um, we couldn't stay there for very long. So it was gathering what information we needed and then getting out quickly, complete with our masks and fingers crossed that we hadn't caught anything awful. COVID was a major problem. It was also a major problem with the headsets. The original idea was that this was going to be a virtual reality headset. But people kept telling us, including this museum, that people are not going to want to put this headset on in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So we had to, to come back to a large screen, which you can see um, later on this afternoon, if you wish. Um, we had to ha look at other ways of delivering this rather than the headset. Not to say that it won't be done one day, it can be done, it's just that in the middle of a COVID pandemic wasn't the best time, really. Okay, next one, should please, thank you. So our um, evidence base was from photographs, documents, oral witness, uh, um, similar to the film. We were, we were trying to establish these as our sources, and I uh, uh, give thanks to all of those different organisations and more um, who gave us uh, assistance, gave us access to the things that we needed. Um, I might mention just a few. The photographs were wonderful. Um, we thought we started with about six. To date, we've now found 111 photographs that were taken in the calculator room at Cadby Hall. So photographs were a huge help. Um, the half adder at Birmingham Museum was fascinating and we took lots of photography just as well because we couldn't go back because that's when the pandemic started. Uh, there were some incredible resources at the Science Museum. Went down to Wiltshire uh, to have a look at the ICL uh, archive, which is not very well catalogued. And one day I went down there, Richard and I were down there, and we opened a box expecting to find more documents um, or dry documents, typed out stuff, and underneath a, a few, we found circuit diagrams. And Richard always says, you could see my jaw drop as I unfolded this circuit diagram, huge diagram, to realise it was Leo 1. 
And there were loads of them, um, of these original circuit diagrams uh, telling us how this machine was built, what it was like, and so on, but not documented. Um, I do pay tribute to, to something, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but something called Britain from Above, funded by the Lottery Fund. Absolutely amazing resource. If you uh, go online, look at it, if you want to look at our country over time, but from up in the air. That let us see what Cadby Hall was like in the past and, and through beautiful photographs. Um, and of course, I'd like to mention the London, uh, 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 um, uh, the archive at uh, the, I've lost it, lost it, London Metropolitan Archive. I always, always say it incorrectly because that was our starting point, really. I always remember the day that we all went there and I expected to find some old dusty documents. And, uh, and the lady came from behind the counter with this huge plan. Next, please, Richard. You can't see it very, very well, but uh, this was it. And it was a plan from 1949 from Lyons into the London County Council. And it had two areas marked in pink. And they were to, as it says uh, uh, across the bottom, proposed alterations um, for, uh, for, uh, on the second floor for the installation of an electronic computer. Um, this area was used for ice cream sales um, in WX block, which is the admin block, and it was, it was coloured pink. It showed us that there was a second room, that that's where the data entry took part, but for me, it was huge help because it was full of measurements. It told us how high the ceiling was. And it told us where the pillars were and the doors and all sorts of things because it was to scale. It was drawn up properly and was just the start we wanted. Next. Um, so what we would then do, and I apologise again if this isn't, isn't too clear, I, I would use Adobe Illustrator to then extract from that source document all the measurements necessary, do lots of other calculations and build entire plans that told us not just the size of the room, but what the windows were like, how big they were, how far up the wall they went, all manner of measurements that would come together and then I'd pass it to this guy because he would then have to model that so that we could have the room ready. Next. Um, so the room was built in that way, gathering from the, from the initial plans, looking at some of the photographs, and starting to build what the room looked like in, on the second floor of WX block. Then we move to the furniture. And the furniture, if you like, starts with the racks. So we looked at some of the photographs of the racks. And you start then, as part of the project, to discover things that people didn't tell you. Lots of people told me that the racks were on top of a false floor. It's not true. The racks were built on a concrete floor and the floor was built around the racks. And photographs like this, you can see the angle brackets at the bottom and we, we took measurements and we can see the venting at the bottom that's going to take up the false floor and we could work out how it was put together. And in a small, tiny way, contribute back to the archive more information than we were taking we were starting to analyse pictures and give more information back. Then, of course, next please, it was take that rack and measure on the photograph and do calculations and build a complete plan right down to the nuts and bolts of how that rack was put together so that it could be modelled. Next. Um, that would then become a wire frame and eventually would become a rack. That was a computer digital model that could be then placed inside um, the model of the room as that progressed. And that's how we worked through all the furniture, piece by piece. Next. Some bits were a bit complicated. This is the half adder at Birmingham Museum. What do we do about that? The half adder, for those of you that don't know, <laughs> is a really important part of a computer. Without half adders, none of them would work. It's a vital part. I wanted this inside the virtual Leo. 
So we then had to, uh, we couldn't go back to Birmingham because of COVID. We went back to our photographs and painstakingly, I mean, I used to have good eyes, but painstakingly we'll go through all these photographs and look at all these components, work out resistor, capacitor, what value resistor, what value capacitor, and start to, with the other components to, to build it. What valves were used? Yes, next. Um, so some of you won't be able to see because it's, 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 it's not clear enough, but um, that some of these are numbered. I would number them all section by section, and we would slowly bring this to life, um, passing it through to be modelled. Next, Richard. So it would then end up as something like this. This is not real. This is all virtual. It's just clean. Um, but it looks so much like the original. And of course, there it is, uh, the virtual version, complete with the appropriate frame, the right valves, and all the components necessary underneath, together to build this in very important unit called the half adder, which if you were studying computer science, you know something about and really be those youngsters that come here that are studying computer science need to know about. Okay, next. Sometimes we went for big things and here is a picture of um, the site uh, uh, quite some time ago, late 40s, and uh, this whole area here, all the way around here, is um, the Cadby Hall. Um, Cadby Hall actually really to see from here is, 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 is over here somewhere but I think you can see the vans oh yes here we are we've got all the vans um, and uh, Olympia in the background and we have a piece here uh, if I can see it here we are this section here is WX block and our computer is in there yeah yeah please there's a there's nice chair Nice chair here, which will give me a short little break to think. <laughs> Whilst Frank moves, I'll explain why that's important. It's important because we put windows in the thing. The room had got very large windows, and very quickly we started to realise that we needed something outside the windows, and we didn't want to put anything outside the windows... You all right there, Frank? Okay. So we wanted to make sure the windows told a story and therefore we had to have the right building. So Richard and I were looking at old maps, we were looking at aerial photography and building up a shape of the buildings that would be outside if you looked. Next. Um, so we, we, in the end, settled for what we call and has become quite famous in the project, Lisa knows this, uh, Photo 87. Photo 87 was where we were, is, it was going to be our basis for um, filling the room with furniture. Um, it's quite late in Leo One's life, it's very operational, doesn't really represent what was happening when it was being constructed or developed, but it certainly is um, quite cluttered. Um, but nevertheless, it's, the, it's what we were aiming for in terms of peripheral devices and the rest of the bits and pieces that we saw uh, uh, in the room. Next. Um, yeah, we started off with half a dozen photos, and then we got, as I said recently, 111 photos. In the end, I put the photos onto, some, onto a plan, and also identified where the photo was taken from and the direction the photographer was facing, and roughly in a time scale when it was taken. And that as a resource in itself was really useful to me to help work out what was where and to, and to do comparative measurements off of um, black and white photography. Um, but also again, I think we've put something back into the Leo One archive which hopefully people in the future will help. If you want to play around with this and click on those numbers and see what was where, then it's on the website. Next, please. Um, talking of photographs, we did a little test. This is some time ago now, where we looked at what we'd done so far 
and we wanted to see how it looked if we took a photo, if we rendered the photo from the virtual model as it was becoming real. This isn't real. It's a virtual model. You can tell it's a virtual model because it's too clean. But nevertheless, it still looks pretty good. That switchboard at the back looks fantastic. So it's starting to look real and also indicates to us that as time ticks on, we can use this virtual model to take new pictures to tell new stories. So it's going to, again, have more use than simply being a virtual resource. Next, there's a few of these photographs. That, again, is virtual, not real. Um, very clean. <laughs> And, 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 I, and I know this is a little bit early because we haven't even put the buttons and switches on the printer tabulator yet. But it, we wanted to test out whether the technology could do this. Next. This is the wonderful Mercury delay lines, which I know Richard spent a lot of time getting these short and long delay lines correct. If you get a chance to go and test it yourself, you can pick them up, move them around, have a look at them um, in a lot of detail. Next. And, of course, what's always a famous view of Leo, um, that looks OK. I'm quite pleased with that. Apart from the fact that the fluorescent lights are not the right way round, you spotted that, didn't you? Um, that's because when we did this as a test, we hadn't put the ceiling on yet because it gets in the way as, as, as you're developing things. So um, I, uh, Richard did it. He was very, he was very pleased with the output until his father said, yeah, but you're... The fluorescent lights are not the right way around. But it was only a test. I just wanted to show you. Next. Um, we then seeded documents. I wanted to go to the archive, take out documents that existed there, and put them around the room. Some of them, a lot of them, are just lying on desks and things. Some of them are inside a filing cabinet. There's, there's a few inside the manager's briefcase and so on, some up on a notice board. But there are documents. So we chose some from the archives. Some of them were diagrams. Some of them were uh, written documents that someone's working on at the moment. Uh, some of them articles. And, of course, some of them quite important and got potential use which is Leo's actions. In other words, the ins its instruction set. So we can see how uh, uh, code is, is, is put together. So there are quite a few documents seeded into the room itself. Next. Um, so the calculator room, we've, it's, it's built, it exists. You can look out um, and look in, and it, it's there, it's, it's reborn. It's not lost anymore, um, but it also included 35 objects that you can click on and find out more about. Um, seven objects that you can click on and start to interact with, like that half adder. You can pick it up and start to rotate it and turn it and zoom and have a look more closely. Um, it has 44 documents that you can access. Some of them are just one or two pages. Some of them are ten pages. We, 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 we varied it. Um, but almost all of them have got their reference numbers on. You can go to the archive and look at the full document if you wish. Um, about 43,000 words of text, supported text, that tells people more about what they're looking at under different themes. Some of that's technological. Some of that's about social history. Some of it's about people. If you're only interested in one aspect, don't read the lot. Read just the bits that you're interested in giving people choice. Over 130 photographs are also added in to the virtual room um, in order, and, and a lot of those are the black and white pictures. I'm, I'm pleased about that because I'm so pleased that we found so many. Uh, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, video snippets just to show something working, and five people um, who are sitting in the room uh, or standing in the room and we can click on and find out more about what they do. So that uh, back in 1950s, if you were a programmer or an engineer or whatever, um, what exactly did they do? We wanted to provide some access and also to recognise the fact that uh, people were so important to this machine. 
We've not really concentrated that much on the technology. If we did, we perhaps would have argued to rebuild it, but that would have been a waste of time because a superb uh, machine has been rebuilt called EDSAC at TNMOC that tells them much about the technology that LEO was based on. What we were trying to do was to reproduce something which is a working environment. That room was a working environment for people to walk in day after day after day and suffer a lot of disappointments um, as they worked over a long time to get LEO not just to work, which is what the aim was for a lot of the older machines, but to be part of the jigsaw puzzle that was Lions as a business. It had to do that. It had to pay the wages at the end of every week. It wasn't really good enough to say, it's not working today. Let's, let's, let's take a break for a week or two while we get it working. It had to have that sense of reliability. Um, okay, so what we, lastly, um, first of all, yeah, thank you. As, as Lisa's already said, but yeah, thank you to these people, this museum, um, the Heritage Fund and the Leo Society. Without those people, it wouldn't have happened. And it's great, the projects uh, 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 come to fruition, but I, I've also found it fascinating and really interesting to understand that much more about Leo, um, uh, even if it's right down to the last inch and nut and bolt and what was where. You know, it has been very, very interesting. Um, so thank you. And then what I did finally is to do a quick run through, a quick tour myself and just switch the video on just to show you uh, five minutes worth. It doesn't do it justice. So once you've had your coffee and your lunch and I can see by your faces it's getting desperate now. You need, you need it. Um, w once you've had that, come over and have a look. Um, eventually, well, I mean, we've, got, we've had it running here for a while to get some feedback. It's going to go and is on a tablet. There's a couple of tablets over there. Soon it will be disseminated through the, um, um, the, ICE, the Apple App Store, yes. Um, so we, we will disseminate this and we are listening to see if we need to make any slight changes. Um, okay, let's, let's see if we can play the video. There's no sound to this video, so I'm going to talk over it if that's all right. Hopefully this is going to work. So here we are in the calculator room. Um, and these two circles, by the way, are for people that use it as a tablet. Because you know what youngsters are like. They do everything with their thumbs. So uh, that's how you'll be able to move it. So we're, we're moving in and having a, a quick look around. Remember, this is not a book. It is not a, a film. You can go where you like, when you like. I just happen to be choosing this route. There's always issues of controversy. I will mention it. Is that the right blue? Um, that was a big debate for a long time. Um, so we're moving on. You can see the mercury delay lines here. These are the manager's desk and the shift operator's desk. These little uh, circle things are... Um, targets where you can click and pins where you can click and gather more information if you want to. You don't have to. Um, so there's the mercury delay lines. Uh, we'll do a little, little stroll over to the window. The only thing we couldn't do, I was really disappointed in him. He could not reproduce the smell of the cakes being made <laughs> across Cabby Hall, which was a bit of a shame. But all of this is authentic. That was Addison's mansions. Um, and uh, a lot of that is accurate according to the aerial photography. So we've got a little test area here, um, which was accurate at some point. Engineer doing some work. Uh, we'll go back through the racks, I think. Stuff's coming up on here to tell me where I am in the room, sort of location information. I'm um, going down through the racks. Uh, there's the engineer's console at the end. It appears in so many photographs. Um, and then we'll turn left at the end here. There's someone working on all the electronic diagrams because they kept everything up to date if changes were made or, and so on. Um, and then we'll drift over to the peripheral side of the room, which, again, a lot of controversy started with um, STC-made uh, machines that were for, had used, utilised magnetic tape. None of it worked, not one didn't work well enough, and they came back to using punch cards, paper tape, um, 
punch card machines from um, British Tabulating Machine Company, Hollerith punch card machines, operators, panel. Go and drift over to, if you want to know what the shy little lights are, then you're going to have to go and try it for yourself. But there's a, there's a Leo One user out there that lives in Canada that was emailing me practically every day to make sure I got that in. And I can say to him, I did. Um, we're clicking on one of the racks here, or a point on one of the racks, and it loads that half adder that we used the Birmingham uh, resource to examine in more detail. You can zoom in on all of this and see the detail um, and understand from a young person's point of view that once upon a time, almost everything was hand-created, handmade. Is it any wonder you've got dry joints? Um, for those that know about dry joints, that's not something in your knee. Um, uh, it, it's to do with old electronics, old analog electronics. Um, so that, that was interesting to see. What else did we have a quick look at? Um, just to show that you can click on one of the documents. But in this case, it's job surveys. A little bit of information comes up. Um, this actually is some handwritten information um, where, where errors are being recorded. The, their whole attitude to things going wrong was to record it, record it, find out, analyse it, understand it in order that you can improve it. So all the documents are there for various reasons and you're getting information appearing on the right uh, under different topics according to what we're, we happen to be looking at. Uh, where are we going? Do you remember, Richard? Oh, yes, so we're going to go over and just double-check that uh, person working on the uh, circuit diagrams because that's in plenty of the black and white photographs. And when we get there, uh, there's, a, there's a tick, uh, a, a pin, so we can click on it. gives us some basic information, and then by choice, if we wish, we can go in a lot, lot deeper. Um, and if we go into this, uh, you can see... Um, Richard actually painstakingly took the originals from where we found them in the Science Museum and redrew them so that they were nice and clear. Um, and, and, and we can access information about uh, uh, this, this uh, if we wish, and find photographs and diagrams and all sorts of things. Okay. So I think we turn around now. When I've seen and watched a couple of young people, indeed Lisa has fed this back to me, who have already been using this here at the museum, of course, they're through, they're through this in, like, seconds, because, you know, they do it so quickly. You will find it harder. Sorry, but it's just a fact of life. But they can work through this much, much quicker um, and speed around and look for the things that they want to find. I'm stopping at that point because that's the most common view of Leo 1, that, that where photographs were usually taken um, um, by photographers if they came to see this machine. Um, once again, thank you to all those people involved. Thank you to my son, because he's done so much of the, of the hard stuff, whereas his dad has just demanded more and more um, to get more and more things in. So uh, that was a quick run through. Thank you very much for listening. Hopefully you'll come over and give it a try later on. Thank you very much. Oh wow, it is a bigger crowd than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, d I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of the National Lottery Heritage Fund to see firsthand um, the positive impact that our support on heritage, product, uh, heritage projects across the UK. We're the largest yet funder in the UK for heritage and believe in the power of heritage to create positive and lasting change for the peoples and community, both now and in the future. Thanks to the funds raised by the National Lottery players, we were proud to have awarded the Centre for Computing History with a grant of £265,400 um, for this ambitious project. We are delighted 
that the, our funding has enabled the Center of Computing History to preserve, archive, digitize LEO artifacts, documents, and personal memories for now and future generations. It was an impressive feat of archival work that has been done, including 12,000 digitized pages, 705 digitized photos, and 47 interviews catalog. I personally have listened to some of these interviews and it is fascinating to hear each and one, each and every one of these stories and how much impact they have today on our computing history. Bringing the Leo story to life has also been a great opportunity to engage the wider audiences with this fantastic piece of uniquely British history. I, for one, without this project, would have not known about the story of the Leo. We at the fund have been impressed by the reach of this project, including how you were able to rise up against the challenges created by the pandemic, including putting on more than 40 plus um, events. We recognize that in the pandemic, the struggle to keep these projects alive and how to bounce back and how to keep them going. And you can see the success that has happened here. I very much look forward to seeing how visitors respond to exploring the social, cultural, and historical impact of our shared computing history. I'm particularly interested to see about the impact of the virtual Leo. Um, it's such great technology that I think will really hit with a younger generation in understanding how our computing, computing history has transformed to what it is today. I also look forward later to the panel discussion as I think there's so much further scope for preserving and promoting our computing history. Congratulations to the team and to all of those involved, especially the army of volunteers. And thank you again to the National Lottery players for making this possible. Thank you.